co-hosted by Mario and Fidgetal and your voice of the roundtable, Goody. Thank you all for tuning in to a special edition today talking about all of the crypto drama that's going on in the regulatory space the SEC rulings that have come down and the G20 summit that happened this past week at which the International Federation has discussed crypto regulations led by the efforts of India and the U.S. So a lot of interesting things happening in the crypto regulatory space right now and we're excited to dive into it with our panelists that have joined us today and many more to come during the space. Head on down to that comment section and join in the conversation we will be posting some of the best comments, as always, up at the top of the space and including them in the discussion of the show, as well as highlighting some questions down there below for you to join in. Fidgetal, how are you doing today? And then we'll go around the horn and introduce some of the panelists that are on stage joining us for the first time on the Crypto Roundtable. Thanks, good. Obviously, today is one of the most exciting parts for me as an attorney. Um, understanding where the regulatory framework is, is going, and kind of how that interplays with the SEC, the CFTC, and kind of what we've been dealing with for a year now. So I'm excited to discuss. I'm excited for the people on the stage to have a discussion with, um, both from a crypto, IP, NFT, and just in general blockchain perspective. So thanks for hosting, brother. Okay, I just got disconnected or kicked out of Twitter and I'm back. Can everybody hear me? Um, okay, cool. Everybody was on mute at the same time and I got absolutely kicked out of Twitter, out of the app. So thankfully, um, I, I was like very worried for a second just now uh, that I rugged the entire space. And I'm very glad at whatever feature allows you to reconnect to the space without having rugged it. I was, very, I was extremely stressed about having to restart the whole space and get everybody up here. I did not want to make you guys go through another musical intro, but thank you all for coming. Why don't we go around the horn in the, no particular order, just the order you guys are appearing on my screen. Just a quick introduction for everybody. Since you guys are new to, to this rendition of the Crypto Roundtable, we'll start with the Wolf of All Streets. A uh, little introduction about yourself, your background, and um, you being here today. Thank you for coming on such short notice as well. Sure, thank you for having me. <clears throat> I got rubbed when I tried this uh, last week, so no surprises there. I had <laughs> the exact same experience. Um, yeah, my name is Scott Melker. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I host the Wolf of All Streets podcast. I uh, also have a YouTube channel and write a newsletter daily. Uh, I came into the crypto space in 2016 uh, largely as a trader and sort of backed into being orange pilled and obviously going deep down the rabbit hole of the fundamental side. And now, uh, like everything else in my life that I get obsessed with is basically all I do, eat, sleep, uh, and drink, obviously Bitcoin and the crypto market. So I, you know, I'm just by a function of that on top of it, pretty much 24, seven, 365. So very interested in this conversation, obviously, on regulation, sharing my thoughts, but more importantly, learning from everybody else on stage. Appreciate you once again for coming. Simon, what about you? Hey, I hope it's uh, not too noisy. I'm just in a restaurant at the moment, and uh, I'm going to be shooting off in a bit and then coming back. But um, uh, yeah, so I've, I've been involved in uh, Bitcoin since uh, 2011, where I spoke at the first Bitcoin conference in the world wrote the first published book in the world to include Bitcoin in 2011 um, and uh, co-founded Bank to the Future, which invests in uh, companies and some of our portfolios are companies like Coinbase, Kraken, Bitstamp, Bitfinex, Ripple Labs, uh, and uh, yeah, many, about 100 of the largest companies in crypto. Um, I guess we hacked regulations in 2010 by registering as a securities business and then allowing people to invest in projects like the Ethereum ICO and Bitcoin mining when it was like under $200. And um, we, we're, we're actually now the longest standing company in Bitcoin because we started as a securities business and then worked backwards. So um, dealt with international regulators for over a decade now and 
just seeing this industry grow from a small pipe dream to what it is today, where the largest power plays in the world are looking at the technology we created to transform the financial system. Uh, so happy to have the conversation. And again, I appreciate you for coming. I'm going to probably say that to every speaker because it is something that, again, on short notice and, and putting this together, we appreciate you all. Next, we'll go to Chris, who is a decentralization. I'm going to call you decentralization maxi because you say you're a fierce advocate for it. But Chris, how are you doing? Introduce yourself a little bit. Uh, that's fair. Maxi always makes me think maxi pad. So I think maximalist, you know, we should we should go all the way with that word, in my opinion. But that's, you know, whatever. So, yeah, I um, have been in and around the space for about six years, and my role for the past three has been um, exposing decentralization theater, uh, mostly in and around the DeFi on Ethereum space, but also beyond into the exchange space as well. I think there is a lot of decentralization theater that's going on right now um, with regard to What's going on with um, in the current regulatory world? I, I I don't see most of this as an ambush, which is the way that a lot of the players like to portray it. I see it more as a dance um, between pretty willing participants. I think there's a lot of acting going on out there. Uh, I think that if it can be regulated, it will be regulated. I come from a sort of Bitcoin first mentality, and I think that everybody who's been building in the space in a place that government can touch has known all along that government would touch it. And I think that it's important context for the conversation we're having today. Thank you. Of course. And again, thank you for coming. Uh, we'll go to crypto immersion next, uh, or Alex, whichever you like to go by, um, a little bit about yourself. Ex sec lawyer was always interesting to see that. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Soul woman on the panel again. Wow like with the nth time um so you can call me alex is fine i'm a corporate and securities lawyer i used to work at the sec in a big giant firm and i managed a practice and uh, then i founded two companies and i exited went into blockchain in 2016 um, and i've been there since originally i was there to build something um, a, like a financial marketplace but it was not actually um uh, it, uh, it wasn't viable. It was just Ethereum at the time, Bitcoin and Ethereum. And the first conference I spoke at was a packed conference of 200 people. So the next conference I'm scheduled to speak at is in June and it's to 100,000 people. So this space has grown remarkably. Um, it's changed a lot. Um, I have a podcast called Crypto Immersion, which is uh, information on finance and blockchain. Um, and I actually do live recordings. So if you have questions or anything like that, it's a lot of discussions about what's happening. We talk about projects and I don't advocate anything. I don't shill anything, literally just pros and cons. Um, I'm writing a book on DeFi because a publisher asked me to, and I was too dumb to know that I should have said no. And, um, the, and I advise a lot of high net worth individuals and, uh, and some funds and a lot of projects. Um, and for anyone who thinks this space is going to be regulated, it actually already is. It has been for a long time. There's an interesting story about why people think it isn't, um, but it is regulated. It has been regulated. It will be newly regulated. A whole bunch of new regulations have been coming down the pipeline. Um, you're seeing a little bit of it with this G20 summit, but there's actually a lot more coming. Um, and most of that structure you're already seeing leak into our um, into our regulations now and into the regulations of uh, a number of other countries. I appreciate that. It is a lot, that's a lot of information. And as we invite a couple other people up, if you are interested in speaking on the topic or include being included in the conversation, please go on down to the comments section as we will be putting some questions and articles of which we are discussing today, going to another um, manager of legal operations, at least. I don't know if you are a lawyer as well. Peter, a little introduction for yourself. Hey, thanks. Yes, I am an attorney, but I'm just a consultant at Everrise, where I, I am across the legal operations. In my previous practice, I was an associate at Kirkland and Ellis, where I dealt with SEC investigations and other federal investigations. I did not like being a part of big law, so I kind of formed my own practice after that and got into DeFi in 2020, more into 2021, 
So now as a consultant, I do seek to kind of advise people on both ethical and compliant practices. Uh, the short story there is that although I believe that Bitcoin is probably the only true decentralized possibility, um, you know, the world likes options and innovation. So we're stuck with all these other companies coming forward. And so the short story I tell them is simply don't sell your tokens if you created them, uh, not to VCs, not to anybody. So that's my approach on that. Looking forward to the discussion. Thank you for coming. We'll keep it rolling to another lawyer, uh, Ira. Thank you for coming up as well. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, I've been a lawyer for over 30 years now in Silicon Valley, also a computer scientist, and uh, I've been involved in the blockchain space uh, since the days we were mining Bitcoin with our NVIDIA cards, probably not too long after it was created. <laughs> Did Ira just drop his mic or his phone? It sounded like that was... No, no, I, 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 that, that's my, oh. <laughs> short, short and sweet. Yeah, it, was, it was so short and sweet. I literally thought he like dropped his mic at the end. It was a mic drop. And then finally we'll wrap up with uh, Brian as well as Dan. There's so many lawyers on this stage. I mean, what, it, what do they call a lot of, is this a murder of lawyers, a clutch of lawyers? <laughs> There's like, got to be a name for that. This many lawyers on stage. It's, it's called it's called a cache of lawyers. But uh, that, was, uh, <laughs> that was a tech chest. So I'll leave it there. Uh, Brian, what's going on? Yeah. Hey, how's it going? Yeah, I'm Brian. Uh, I've been in crypto, particularly Bitcoin, since 2012. Started following it in 2011. Uh, I actually introduced the founders of Quadriga CX, Daryl Cotton and Michael Patrin to Bitcoin in 2012. Not the, not my finest moment, but uh, yeah, yeah, I've been following this space for a while. I don't particularly think that regulation is a bad thing in crypto. I think ultimately in the long run, it will probably be something that benefits the space. In the short run though, who knows what's gonna happen with that. Yeah, I mean, it is one of the things that ha we've been discussing uh, since the SBF drama kicked off and even prior to that. It's one of the things that we've always, you know, been uh, that's always been a part of the discussion of crypto decentralization, how much interference we want, how much and not even just what we want, but how much is going to come down. And we ha I mean, we had the G20 summit this past week that had some interesting conversations. We had the uh, Janet Yellen saying, you know, that there needs to be strong regulatory, like it's critical to put in a strong regulatory framework for crypto in this space. So it's interesting to see the efforts happening on an international level as well. But one of the first conversations we can start with today as we dive right into it is the ruling last week from a US di uh, district court judge who ruled that the emojis like the rocket ship, the stock chart going up and the money bag indicate a financial return on investment and have legal consequences. There is a lot, there are a lot of projects <laughs> and a lot of coins that use those emojis in a lot of their promotion, as well as people running around this space, influencers and such that love the use of those emojis to the moon is one of the favorite expressions. So now that that is considered an actual usage of potential pump and dump or promise of financial return, what does that mean for all the people that have used it in the past? Um, we'll start with crypto. That, so that I, I, I prefer I, crypto. Just one second. I prefer in the idea, which I think is what you're going to get is what is speech. Right. And, and what is speech in terms of in terms of impacting uh, what would otherwise not necessarily be a credit or running credit investor chills. But how does that play into our social media interplay with, with crypto and blockchain? That's what I'm interested. In. And we'll go to some of the hands first. I'll go to Wolf of All Street and then Peter. Hey, thank you. Yeah, first of all, I think uh, some clarity on what the ruling actually said. It was basically saying that a court case could advance uh, against Dapper Labs and NBA Top Shot. Uh, and basically, that doesn't mean that it's been finalized as of yet. It just meant that there's enough to continue on with the, the process and that the judge in that case was saying that those emojis, which, by the way, I believe is completely nonsensical, um, could be then used uh, along the way in that case. So I think that it just, uh, it's not even worth offering an opinion to be quite honest. I mean, it's, there's, you're opening the door to an 
endless slippery slope uh, of everybody who's ever used these emojis in any scenario. And so I don't really see that getting passed. But I can understand that uh, this federal judge is basically kicking the can down the road uh, to allow it to go to court and to be played out uh, in that manner. Well, and it's interesting to see the former SEC branch uh, chief, you know, tweet the exact, you know, quote of the case and everything. I pinned it to the top for everyone to see. But, you know, she's getting in on the discussion at the very least and adding to that ruling. So it, it might progress further, but pre it's more about precedent, right? Pre like that's what we're looking for than anything else. That's what lawyers look for all the time. I'm not one myself, but my father is. And uh, I'd like to think I learned a little bit, right? Well, as these various district court rulings come out, I mean, none of them constitute precedent. They're just like one trial court judge trying to figure out. They can be kind of persuasive authority down the line for other courts, but the only precedent is set by like controlling courts, like circuit courts of appeals and the Supreme Court. Wolf was exactly right. This is just at the motion to dismiss phase. So it's a lot more lenient in terms of deciding whether the securities laws apply in this case. The one thing I will point out, and I started out with this in the introduction, you know, Dapper Labs did in fact sell these NFTs. And so arguably it's inappropriate for them to sell them and then put in things that indicate they're going to be worth a lot more. I say all the time, best reason to buy an NFT is because you like owning that NFT. You like having that highlight. You like having that NBA top shot. So I don't think it's crazy to say it's slightly inappropriate to put these rocket ships and, and moon shows on your tweets. You know, uh, just taking it back to kind of like the bigger picture of this and, you know, the wave blockchain is not an issue in the dapper case and when we look through a lot of these cases they're really about web 2 it's the web 2 wrapper the statements the advertisements the communications that are dominating these cases it's not something that is incredibly unique about the blockchain or the peer-to-peer -peer transfer of digital assets um, these things tend to move around and i think alex was kind of getting to this point before traditional law i mean you can't do it if it was web 2 you can't do it if it's web 3 because the statements the representations the types of contracting those are the things that are at issue so we have to be very clear when we're discussing these legal issues what's this garden variety implementation of historic sec law and ftc law about avoiding consumer deception and what are the things that are extremely important to the blockchain and crypto ecosystem can we just talk really quickly what this ruling actually said like the ruling really didn't have a lot to say about the emoji thing it was just a tweet that caught people's attention um, that was just part of what the judge called plausibility of becoming a security, right? Was that it had this, you know, investment of profits thing. Focusing on the emojis is not really the issue. What he's really focusing on primarily, according to what I've read, is, I mean, which is the opinion, right? Um, is that, uh, you know, the control that um, that Dabber has over the chain, plus the NFTs, plus the ability to sell. These things seem way more important than you know the emojis the emojis are actually more of an issue in ftx than it than they are here this is a thing which is goes to plausibility but let's remember that all it was is overturning um the uh the motion to to um dismiss this class action lawsuit that's it that's all it was and in order that there so it didn't, crypto, action, it didn't it didn't it didn't overturn the motion no it well it, 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 it dismissed the motion to uh, Correct, because they're saying that there's a question of that exactly and that, that needs to be that needs to be just that needs to be adjudicated. And, but what the interesting part is, is if the emojis are a basis for questioning what is, and that's what I was trying to say earlier, if there is something that is a kind of a bit of, of Web three meets Web two, is do emojis do inferences? equate to speech and how do we how do we adjudicate that, that on a that's, larger basis that's like I said, so the FTX question crypto was, please was, crypto please crypto please i, I just want I, want I want to pass it around ira you on mic please yeah i i um i'll just follow up on what crypto was saying you're saying 
there's been um, other litigations where emojis were at issue and they were construed in many cases to mean what common sense means. So this isn't the first case where emojis are at issue. I know Professor Goldman from Santa Clara Law School writes about this all the time. There are other cases. So it's a question of fact for a try of fact, which tends to be a jury on whether or not an emoji like a rocket ship or whatever means what it means. And let's just assume on the motion to dismiss that a rational inference was as the judge kind of indicated, which means kind of like your your potential investment will go up. And that's how they have to construe it at the motion to dismiss level. A jury could reject that. The question will be, will they really reject that? I guess in Peter's world, they may think it's not an investment, but that your collectible may go up in value. So that's kind of the issue. And I think that's the larger point. And crypto, you actually hit on pretty, pretty uh, pointedly, which is a lot of people ask, when is regulation going to come into our ecosystem? Regulation, quote unquote, is not going to come into our ecosystem. The regulation already exists, right? This, Dominic, if you keep on doing thumbs down, I'm just going to remove you from the space. Um, okay, goody do job, please. Uh, the reality is that the, the necessary regulation already exists. It's whether there's active enforcement, right? Whether there's application of the existing law. And that's what I'd like to speak to with uh, with our our speakers is where do we think this is going, right? So we've seen interesting, uh, and, and for me at least, it's been a really interesting uh, play with regard to quality of, of, of legal representation. Uh, I think the XRP legal representation has been second to none. Uh, and the library case was an interesting one for me. And it, it's also, I think, gonna be interesting in how the quality of legal representation impacts the uh, application of law into our our ecosystem. Uh, Chris, you have your hand up. What's going on? Uh, yeah, just first to, to give a little color on my comments, I think the SEC is an unconstitutional organization that shouldn't even exist under U.S. law. I think it's inefficient. I think it's corrupt. And I think that uh, the private market could figure this out a lot better than they are. With that being said, I also think that it's very clear what Dapper Labs meant when they put the emojis up there in their tweets. And I think that, you know, coming from the point of view, not of a lawyer, but of a human being who participates in this space and understands the motives that are present. Uh, and I see this a lot with uh, DeFi, with decentralized finance on Ethereum. There are a lot of players out there that are trying to walk a very, very thin line and they know exactly what they're doing. And when you put a rocket ship and a moon and a chart going up in your tweet, you are trying to get the point across that this is gonna go up in value. And if people buy it, they might get rich. It's a moonshot, whatever you wanna call it. So we need to be logical as well as lawyerly. And uh, I'll continue to bring these types of insights into the conversation if you think they're valuable. I appreciate it. And Peter, I didn't know you were an attorney. Um, so what I'm interested personally is, so I'll just I'll just lay it out there. I don't believe that the the Ripple case or the Tether case. I think the library case is kind of a, a, a secondary thought in general. But I don't think Ripple or Tether will be decided before legislation is impacted in some form or, or enacted in some form, of, either fully or or at least KYC and, and tax uh, realities. Does anybody think differently in terms of when they see where the litigation will actually? reach uh, a pinnacle of some sort or do we all think that it's all just based on when regulatory and legislation comes into play go ahead wolf oh sorry um i i, I was uh not i saw there were people raising my hands so i backed off but um i would say that actually it's interesting I think it will get a lot of precedent from those cases and that it might take a lot longer to get actual regulation or legislation than I, I think a lot of people are thinking. I think that this is a very easy topic to take the can down the road. And inside our echo chamber, we think that this is extremely important. But outside of it, I think that the uh, rest of the world is concerned with much bigger issues than regulating crypto. So I, I wouldn't say that uh, I'm either optimistic or pessimistic. I just believe that the time frame is going to be a lot longer than a lot of people are expecting. The case that we're not talking about, and I did, I'm sorry to take it slightly off topic because it's not about what is or is not a security, but I don't hear anyone talking about the fact that uh, Grayscale's suit against 
the SEC is going to court on March 7th. Um, and that is going to be bigger than any, any all of them combi combined, in my opinion, because if Grayscale happens to win, I would say odds are strongly against it. But if Grayscale happens to win, we will likely very quickly see a Bitcoin spot ETF, which I think is the biggest game changer in the space, period. Um, and nobody's talking about it. So I, I think you guys can definitely dig in further uh, on the other side. We have a lot of lawyers here who can speak to that. I just find it interesting that Wolf, we would you mind to reference. Would you mind just uh, touching on the, the, the topic base for the, the rest of the, the uh, people are listening right now? Sure. Well, uh, obviously, um, Grayscale is the, uh, uh, owns the GBTC uh, Grayscale Bitcoin Trust, which has been the basically the way that people who would have uh, utilized a ETF to invest in their IRAs and, and beyond. Uh, but it's an inferior product that's traded from a 50% premium to recently a 50% discount to net asset value or to NAV because it's basically traded freely. There's a lot of reasons, but they've applied, and so have many other people, but they've applied to convert that into an ETF, which would dramatically lower the fees and would effectively make the ETF, this product, trade at net asset value and closely follow the price of spot Bitcoin. Now, that's been denied over and over again, but the reasoning from the SEC has been dubious and largely opinion uh, as opposed to fact. There's Bitcoin spot ETFs all over the world, and there's plenty of precedent. We have gold spot ETFs. There are a lot of reasons that they should happen. So if Grayscale, who is now, count, who's now suing the SEC as a result of this repeated rejection, if they win, are we, the SEC would basically have no... Uh, standing to reject a Bitcoin spot ETF and basically anyone you speak to in the institutional space, there's quite a lot of people who are waiting to invest in Bitcoin until they have that product and ETF to, to do it. So there's a pretty widespread belief that the institutional wall of money, we're, talk we're not talking about, you, you have to differentiate between institutions when you talk about crypto. We always sort of put them all in one bucket, but most quote unquote institutions that are in the crypto space are crypto focused hedge funds. Yes, they are institutions, but they're focused on crypto. So this is the way that we get the wall of money, the pensions, the endowments, the sovereign wealth funds to give them a way that they can compliantly get it past their risk managers and their CFOs, a way that they can actually invest in Bitcoin. It's the biggest thing that could possibly happen. I'm not saying that it will much bigger than any of these other cases. And strategically, just because for those who don't know, it's it's um... I'll, I'll let you expand, but it's a function of or, or a, a sub of DCG, which I believe is still the largest uh, crypto company in the world. Is that correct? Yeah, I, I believe that is correct. I mean, you can talk about exchanges uh, as arguably larger, but obviously we don't have much transparency <laughs> into their, their balance sheets. So what would this mean for DCG or the largest institutions in, in the game and why they're doing this at this moment? Well, they've been trying to do it for quite a while. I don't think there's anyone who can rationally look at GBTC and believe that a product that's trading at a 35 to 50 percent discount to NAV is the best consumer protection or way for people to invest in this asset class. So, I mean, even, you know, Grayscale, as you said, parent company is GCG, although it's very important to differentiate because they have nothing to do with Coindesk or Genesis is obviously under pressure or, uh, you know, uh, None of that, which I think is Wait, a DCG, lot of DCG has nothing to do with them? No, I'm saying Grayscale themselves yes, are completely yes. separated from Genesis, et cetera, and have nothing to do with it. They don't have commingled funds. The trust is audited and fully backed. So that's not a major concern, at least from, from their perspective. But like I said, they would, even though Grayscale will make quite a bit less money, actually, on an ETF than a trust. It's a superior product and the one that will allow them to, I think, exist and, and uh, perform into the future. I agree. Just wanted to make sure that everybody was like up to date with the information and kind of trading on the same information, for, for lack of better words. DCG definitely has a hell of a lot to do with uh, Genesis. <laughs> I wasn't saying that. Cool. As long as we're on the same page. Uh, let's go to crypto, then Peter. Uh, just the... Grayscale uh, is not separate from Genesis. There's actually a lot of data from the crypto sleuths that uh, clearly shows how um, Three Arrows and uh, and Genesis and um, Grayscale are all connected. 
uh, and it opens up a huge number of legal problems. Um, and then the other thing Gen Genesis and Three Arrows Capital were heavily trading the premium on Grayscale, no question. They, no, no, they were, no... There, was a, there was a false loan and they were using the loan, right? At the, so they used Three Arrows as the intermediary where Three Arrows was essentially purchasing and then repaying the loan with shares of Grayscale so that it looked like it was a third party. But essentially what happened is they were using those shares as collateral. And that is how DCG, particularly Genesis, was able to get collateral of Grayscale and use that in other transactions. And one of the reasons that Grayscale and Gemini ended up coming to a solution was, as I understand from the from what has been shown to me, um, is because of this connection is actually much more volatile um, and higher risk. It's in their best interest to close ranks at this point. Uh, the other Sorry, just for, for clarity, do you mean Genesis and Gemini? Or Sorry, uh, Gemini? Genesis like and, Gemini. and Gemini. Genesis and Gemini. So they were at odds uh, and then realized they both had jeopardy, were in jeopardy on in this particular topic. The other part um, of this is, um, oh, I don't even remember what the original point uh, that you'd asked about was. So, um, Ripple Library. Oh, um, so yeah, so about. thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, so um, library is our precedent, so it definitely matters. Um, and uh, it's not an awesome precedent, but it is what it is. Um, the uh, secondary market part was not actually a ruling right that's not that's not something that's a precedential ruling it's literally a single instance and then for ripple i actually tweeted today about um, a statement that was made that you know it's unlikely that ripple um you know is going to win because the person who's the ceo of chia actually had um a, he came out and said that you know they're unlikely to win and they did these things wrong and we did these things this other way and this is the way that's correct and, uh, and then someone else pointed out, well, you know, Ripple did things that way too, and they were not correct. And the truth is that um, Chia sort of backed into a method that works. So um, what I think is really interesting first is that uh, how is it that so many people are, are so incredibly confused about how the rules work? Um, and the second thing is, um, and I don't mean that in a, der in a derisive manner or anything like that. I really don't. It's just... I think a lot of companies, uh, I see a lot of founders kind of running blind or not asking lawyers, and I think that that's dangerous. Um, and the second part of that is that um, you have to realize where the law comes from. A lot of people don't actually know where the law is derived from, and and that's a real problem. Like, um, you know, people don't know that how is like one part of one test, like it's one test of one part of, of one part of a long list of things that are sometimes uh, security. There's another list of things that are never securities and another list of things that are always securities. And you have to know uh, where things fall. Also, there's a lot of law that comes even just from the SEC, right? Um, that comes from like internal interpretations, external interpretations, case law, things like that. And a lot of people will look at a rule and say, okay, I understand how this rule works would that that were you know like would would that that you're referring to you're you're referring to the reeves test that identifies what is or is not no 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 uh, well i was actually referring to howie which was in one no action letter i i understand i understand the howie test the reeves test I, defines right, it's, what it's is for what is for lending practices that's another okay. test but there are more right there's edwards there's a bunch of other tests right and there's just for even investment contracts so there are other there are other um, analysis positions that are applied in specific circumstances that it's very important to understand where your circumstance is primarily because it you can actually create anything that you want to create that's legal. Um, it may not look like what you wanted it to look like or the be in the time frame that you wanted, but I've literally never said no to something that is legal to do it's just you have to be flexible about doing it you have to be you know clear about what your end your 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 end point is what's your outcome that you desire but there are i mean not illegal things if you're trying to do something illegal completely different but if you're trying to do something legal there's a way to do it it's just um i think what people are doing is just looking at past builds we have a lot of copy pasta and people tend to look at their past builds and say, oh, well, this person did it. They must have looked at it and they must have examined and made sure that it was correct. And that's often not the case. And so we have um, an entire segment right now of crypto that is ready to fall simply because so many people replicated the same error over and over and over again. So there's only one thing that I can say on the stage and then I'm done is uh, I would just say 
please don't assume that any other application has actually looked at any law or even been you know, fully vetted um, in terms of the code or in terms of finances or anything like that, don't, don't assume that that exists because it, it probably doesn't. Do your own research, not just when you're investing, but when you're building. And I'm gonna push back just slightly and say, stop doing your own research. Um, it doesn't actually solve anything. It doesn't actually mean anything in the space. I think the biggest, uh, I'm going to you, Peter, in a second. I think the biggest thing we're going to learn is that the most impactful legal standard is going to be post hoc, so looking back on what you did. And so it wouldn't be just necessarily just copying something else. But as I said earlier, the laws exist. Like, you know, if you're doing fraud, you know, if you're soliciting unaccredited investors, do your best whenever you can is, is, is my mantra. Uh, Peter, thoughts? No, dead same. My, my favorite regulatory strategy is, is don't be an asshole. Um, I think, you know, when we try to determine what is a security, you know, a lot of people try to define it, but I think that the test that really matters is the one that they articulated later on is that, you know, look at the economic reality of the transaction and form should be disregarded for substance. Like everything depends on the facts. And so to your point, Fidgetal earlier, is there going to be one kind of kaboom um, where like the Supreme Court weighs in and everybody has clarity? No, absolutely not. Um, first of all, I don't think the Supreme Court will take the Ripple case if it gets that far. Um, I think they would want it to bubble through the various circuits and have some more information. Um, and second of all, I think you know facts are so specific, especially in these cases, that even if the Supreme Court were to articulate a rule in the Ripple case in three years, five years, there's still going to be so many different various things going on that each particular fact pattern is gonna need a, a slight modification to the rule. So, so no, there will be no regulatory clarity from the judicial branch, in my view, um, and that would only come from Congress. And even then, you know, that'll be a muddy water as well. So this is not legal or financial advice. Does anybody, especially if you're a lawyer here, does anybody actually think that the SEC or the government will allow the Ripple case to go to trial, to, to become at issue fully? Absolutely not. I mean, technically, it's, it's up to the judge, and we can question whether one district court judge in New York City is subject to the, the machinery of the whole cabal of government, but it's, it's up to them. And, no, but, uh, but, but Peter, we litigate everything. We understand that everything is a, a, a push and pull, a to and fro of settlement versus cost in reality, oh, right? Yeah, sorry. I, was, I thought you meant the merits. In terms of settlement, no, I mean, no. not, not not the merits. I, I mean, I mean the, the art the act, the dance of law. Ira, right, you, you're on mic for a second. Well, I'm going to be a coward and not answer that, but I am going to point out the irony. No, you will, Ira. Answer that. Uh, I'm going to opt out of answering that. Um, you know, <laughs> Would you I, say I, I, that I, you're I, pleading I, the fifth? <laughs> Chicken! No, Ira's just, he's a stalwart lawyer. I apologize. He's for pleading the tonight. fifth live I on spaces. I, I, I appreciate you coming, Ira. Please go ahead. Thanks. Um, but I will take the opportunity to uh, draw the irony, maybe even heckle a little bit to see what folks have to say about um, why Dapper decided to tee this up. Because, you know, last year when this lawsuit was filed, they did the right thing. They removed it to federal court. And now they're in federal court. They have this pending class action case. It arises out of the MBA Top Shot service. Their terms of use have a robust anti-class action um, binding arbitration provision in it. Like the very first thing that a lot of folks were thinking should be done would be motion to compel arbitration or petition to compel arbitration, as they call it sometimes, and then get that case into the most boring arbitration tribunal in, in, the, in the land, which is great for defendants, which is Vancouver, British Columbia, <laughs> under British Columbia law. And no class action, private tribunal, for the life of me. I don't understand why that wasn't done. There may be good reasons for it, but you know, even today, you go to the Dapper Top Shot site, you could take a look at the arbitration clause. Um, it's as of August of last year, still the same. Does anyone know why they didn't go ahead and move to compel arbitration? and? have this thing handled in a boring manner with no class action? 
they have fin they have no financial backing, Ira. I mean, you know, regardless of financial backing, I mean, defendants like to try to not have a class action and to move things to arbitration. So I, I don't understand why this case was teed up on a motion to dismiss in federal court in New York when they could have at least tried that. So that's kind of my heckle uh, of the day. No, but I, I'm, I'm asking you to answer the question with the question. What's that? Why didn't it? Yeah, I don't know why they didn't do it. I mean, I, I think that's probably, you know, absent knowing something else, you know, generally speaking, uh, that would be the playbook. Maybe they just wanted a little FAFO action. I don't know. Maybe I, they need to hire one of the lawyers on this panel. You know, you, you have a scenario where the common thought was that this was going to be a defensible case. But you still have a bet the company type of situation going on um, if a class action gets certified and if it's considered a security. And then you have in there elements potentially for, you know, gambling. Um, the first thought, and you have discovery. So, yeah, and the discovery alone, the e discovery could be highly intrusive. And so the first thought that I had when I saw that was, get this thing over to arbitration and the precedent that you'd be setting would be arbitration clauses are enforceable and really, really good. And they didn't do that. So we don't know if the arbitration clauses would be enforceable in this context. I, I'm assuming that they would be uh, because folks as a condition of using the site have to opt in. You grab the date, the time, the IP address, it shows their consent. And so unless I'm missing something, that's something that could have really helped them here. My guess is that they don't give that much of a shit at the end of the day. Or I mean, the, go ahead, Peter. Or sorry, well, also too. I mean, what better publicity than to be the one that is seen to be fighting this dragon? You know, I, I don't know what was going on. Yeah, like arbitration is quick and relatively painless, but I'm sure that they're getting a lot of support now. And maybe some people they think, you know, it's a business decision. Here we are. We're fighting the fight. We're out here. So come buy more Top Shots. I'm going to guess it's a, it's, it's a less of more uh, argument, which is we did this. We probably trusted some third party uh, companies to support it and do it and launch it. And now it's a headache. Let's let them deal with it. At the end of the day, it becomes even more of a headache. We'll deal with it when it comes in there. I don't well, think there, it's strategic. There is, there is still an out. I've seen cases where even though the motion to dismiss was heard by a court, the court would still compel arbitration. They didn't consider it enough of a waiver of uh, engaging the forum to waive arbitration. But it would seem to me like that's something that ought to be considered. It's not legal advice, but I would love uh, I would love it if they somebody would let us know what their thinking is if they could. Did you just say that was legal advice, Ira? No, if they want to give me a paint, no, I'm just kidding. It's, it's not, it's not. Legal advice, <laughs> this went from a very interesting discussion to a cabal of lawyers talking amongst themselves and it's okay. We still have one lawyer with her hand up and we'll go to her real quick before switching topics to the G20 summit and a couple other things. But one of the things that I wanted to point out real quick, I pinned, I tweeted just now from the round table account and pinned to the top. Coindesk just tweeted a few minutes ago that crypto crime accounted for a record high $20.6 billion of blockchain transactions in 2022. Sanctioned activity and hacking were two categories behind the rise in illicit transaction volume. If that much illicit activity and or illicit transaction volume is going through this space, especially as a lot of that is stuff that's stolen money anyway, that's hacked wallets, that's bridged, hacked bridge, bridges and stuff like that. Um, like when that kind of stuff is happening, don't we need some form of control or regulatory action or, or anything in this space to at least help the average consumer from those kinds of hardships, so to speak? Um, and I'll go to crypto immersion and then we'll, we'll switch it to the G20 topic. Um, so, uh, I'm actually freaking right now. So that's fun. Um, so I, I just, I just wanted to, um, 
Actually, I don't know if I can talk right now. <laughs> because it's, actually, it's actually one of my favorite yeah. songs, so if you could just stop talking and let that play. The background <laughs> music is uh, is pretty good right now. <laughs> it's pretty awesome, right? Um, it's you're, a still, you're still you're still you're still talking. I want to I want to hear the song. Real quick. Fidgetal. We can play the song as yeah. an outro. Let her actually say what she wanted to say, so we can keep going without the musical intervention in the middle of the space. Thank you. So so regarding the um, the uh, class action. Um, it's true that, uh, that class action waivers are enforceable. Um, and I'll turn it down so you're not distracted by the gorgeous music. Um, no, please, please turn it up. <laughs> um, so um, it is true that, you, that they're not waivable, but there is the ability to um, have a, to, to um, opt out of the waiver and, um, and still create an action. So there's, there's actually quite a lot of uh, very nuanced litigation around that particular point. So, um, you know, I, I could see that they probably tried to use uh, arbitration alone and, and perhaps weren't successful. So New York is just one of the states that happens to be, I think, um, particularly difficult with that, with that thing. So um, just to let you know, like, they, they may have tried and just were unsuccessful. And uh, Peter, if you wanted, you had put your hand up as well. Uh, go one last lawyer. Well, no, this is not a legal point. This is actually, you raised the point about $20 billion being lost to hacks and, and what the hell are we going to do about that? Obviously, you know, we got to fight that and we got to find responsible purveyors and, and figure out a way to get our house in order. But let me just point out that this $20 billion number, probably a lot of it was not exactly liquid. It's not so accurate. And meanwhile, if we're all trying to get out from under the yoke of these centralized institutions, let's recall that U.S. banks collect about $8 billion per year in overdraft fees alone, and that is liquid. So, you know, as we kind of talk about how to adopt this system that might save us from centralized control, let's recall that, yeah, there will be some stickiness, there will be some negative externalities, but the, the beast we are attempting to fight is a lot bigger than the problems we have in our own house. And, and Simon, you can uh, speak on that too, I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the benefit of peer-to-peer -peer finance is that law enforcement have to do their job rather than outsourcing it to financial institutions. Um, and sorry if the background music's a bit uh, here. We've got the background music um, crew here. Um, but, you know, when, if, uh, you know, with, with centralized financial institutions, okay, get it, um, if... Uh, we can have all these laws that destroy the movement of money um, and create, you know, uh, the real adoption of Bitcoin by just creating uh, money that you don't own, money that you can't spend and, and money that gets deflated uh, by governments to meet their political goals. Um, then when you have uh, decentralized finance and peer to peer finance, uh, it's not, you know, the laws already exist. If you if I break into your house and steal your cash or steal your gold, uh, then you call the police and law enforcement are meant to do their job. So law enforcement just needs to adapt to the technology um, and the fact that we live in, you know, the, the, a lot of these uh, thefts and hack, this hacking is happening in the cyber world, which is a global uh, movement and uh, law enforcement, you know, should be doing what, what, what they need to be doing, which is investing in the technology to, to catch criminals. And we've given them a brilliant tool, which is the blockchain. Uh, and the blockchain has an immutable record of all transactions. And so they should, they, you know, law enforcement should do their job and get the budget they need rather than outsourcing it to the centralized financial institution. The problem is that not only is this space built on one of the staples of anonymity, right? And that being a hard thing to track in and of itself. I mean, this is this stage in particular is one of the stages that we have filled with more faces than usual in terms of the PFPs. But a lot of this is built on on anonymity and not knowing who's behind those addresses and such. But in addition, the international enforcement is so difficult and cross border enforcement, stuff like that, trying to cap, catch somebody in a, in a foreign country that perpetrated whatever crime that you're trying trying to uh, pursue. And a lot of these are international bases. So it's one of the interesting things that now we see 
is a great transition into the G20 summit that happened. And one of the interesting things we see is the the FB, FSB, IMF, and BIS, for those that don't know those acronyms, it's the Financial Stability Board, the International Monetary Fund, and the Bank for International Settlements will deliver papers and recommendations establishing standards for a global crypto regulatory framework. Uh, and those will be delivered by the institutions in July and September. So it's one of the things that I'm curious about is like, how are we going to enforce these on an international basis and what are these international frameworks going to look like especially as they pertain to not only bitcoin being the largest one and ethereum being the the largest nft chain but as well as a lot of the other ones that exist in the space we'll go crypto merging and then back to simon okay so it's fallout boy now just by by the way that's that's what's on <laughs> um so um the, the new regulatory scheme that's coming out is actually derived uh, in large part by FATF, which is the Financial Action Task Force. Um, and it was, uh, they put out a, um, a proposal. There, it's a, 200 countries that are either observers or signatories, but are mandated to usually implement some version of whatever is recommended by FATF. But as um, digital assets uh, became more prevalent, what ended up happening is um, the uh, FATF said, okay, uh, we recommend that you put in some sort of, uh, of rule regarding this issue with fraud um, and with par par particularly um, the money travel rule, which is about money laundering. And, um, and so they said, we really need you, to, we need you to do this. And, and there was so little action on part of the country, on the part of the countries that were supposed to implement rules, they actually made it a requirement. So I believe that this is a uh, recommendation 13 or 16. It's one of the two. Um, and it is actually now um, it, it's mandatory. And you can actually see the language starting to seep through into different um, different laws. And it's called FAT F. It is. I mean, I think people may have may call it other things, but it is called FAT F, F A T F, which is Financial Action Task Force. And, um, and, and I think probably, uh, and Simon, you can tell you the British actually refer to it something far more elegant, but, you know, here, um, you know, <laughs> we just call it fat F and, um, and you can actually see some of the language uh, leaking in at this point. And so what we're going to see primarily is less of an emphasis on class um, uh, or form, which is like, is this a security or a currency, et cetera, and more of an emphasis on risk. So this is going to be uh, essentially a lot of risk assessment and your regulatory structure and enforcement is going to be based on the amount of risk that is assessed with your particular product. Most things are either going to be a financial product or what you would consider to be a security and things are actually going to fall into um, regulatory schemes based on that construct. So it's, um, you know, again, we can start seeing this language seep in. We start seeing how things are developing. I'm always, um, you know, skeptical whenever the BIS jumps into anything because the BIS basically only cares about the dollar. Um, and I, I don't, uh, I have a, a lot of statements on that one, uh, mostly because there's a lot of evidence on it. Um, but all they really want to do is promote the dollar. So I'm always cautious and skeptical whenever I see them jump onto something because it looks like they're basically just the mouthpiece of a lot of the American financial institutions. And, um, and that is what they promote. So you're, they're really more, um, they're not technically a propaganda arm, but lately in the past two to three years, they function so much as a propaganda arm that um, it's concerning because that's not really their role. So anyway, um, but it'll be an interesting time period. Well, and it's interesting to see the managing director of the IMF say something along the lines of banning crypto should not be out of the question for G20 countries and that that could be a, a managing force in these regulatory actions is some harsh language coming from you know, directors and, and high up voices. And it doesn't sound like there's a lot of push in a lot of these articles, at least it doesn't sound like there's a lot of push for on the pro crypto side of a lot of these things. Simon, why would the G, why would the G20 be pro crypto? Why would a, a governmental amalgamation be pro crypto? 
Here. Yeah, that's a, it's it's honestly it's the most of them are working on some form of CBDC, which is direct. No, not, not 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 even that. Why would they be endorsing? I mean, took, it took away their borders and their financial controls. Simon, what up? Yeah, the, the <laughs> funny acronyms we got here. So we got the FU. No, what have we got? The the BS, the Fat FU, and the International Monetary Economic Hitmen. Um, so yeah, the, these are all these are all stewards of the dollar, and they the way that they get there um, is it, what happens with every empire. We had it with the Brits, we had it with the Dutch, uh, we'll have it with the Chinese, we have it with America now. The you have um, these organisations, these international multi multilateral organisations, that their job is to get the world addicted to their drug, which is dollar debt, um, and then once you have that, uh, you then have the which is normally backed by who spends the most on military. Um, and then you have the ability to control regulations, infrastructure, lending, um, and implement your economic hitmen policies. Um, so the, the FATF, um, we are actually a registered virtual asset service provider at Bank to the Future. Uh, we're a securities business in Cayman Islands and FATF said you need to meet these standards um, and so they're the regulator of the regulator. Um, so each and every regulator has a regulator uh, and uh, this is how they do it. And obviously this is the importance of Bitcoin because exiting the traditional financial system is how you regulate the regulator of the regulator. And so as long as we have the ability to exit, then Bitcoin becomes that regulator, which is why it's so important to maintain that. Now, the US is really far behind on this because around the globe, they're all implementing virtual asset service provider regimes as recommended by FATF. Um, and they're starting right now with travel rules and AML, um, but we do need a compromise between securities laws, commodities laws, and currency laws. And virtual asset service provider is a, is a great way to achieve that. So if you can start with AML and you can regulate it like a currency, uh, but then you appreciate that blockchain has these centralized actors that validate, pre-mine, and issue these tokens. Um, then you need some security law in there. So you need a bit of suitability, investor protection, market manipulation, insider trading. Um, but you don't need to shoehorn it into securities laws like they are in the US. So VASP is, is the perfect way to get that custom regulations that's, that's appropriate for something that has an element of decentralization, but apart from Bitcoin, it always has a very large centralized element to it, which you can then regulate, but it acts a bit like a currency, eventually wants to try and be a commodity, but only Bitcoin achieved it. And then, but there's all sorts of manipulation that happens in between. And that, that's where I think the VASP should be, but it's implemented by tied loads. So you get your regime in by lending money to a country and then FATF works off a blacklisting system. Um, so the, they will just blacklist you if you don't meet certain regulatory obligations and whoever is the existing empire is the one that sets the regime in, in the world order. Yeah, but Simon, how do you balance between tax and fraud? Uh, what was the question between tax and... Tax and consumer protection. Well, all of these, I mean, so tax is going to be code. So clearly CBDCs eventually, the way, the way I see the world in the not too distant future, let's say the next few decades, is you have CBDCs run by governments, AI that becomes more intelligent than governments, Bitcoin and blockchain that gives a check and control to the CBDC. Um, and governments becoming less and less important because AI will eventually be producing its own rules, its own regulations, its own code, its own CBDCs. Um, so governments need to compete with AI and AI will compete with Bitcoin. And Bitcoin's the only thing that um, an AI cannot, you know, can keep an AI honest rather than so, so AI becomes AI becomes the global government. Uh, Blockchain becomes the global decentralization, and Bitcoin becomes the global currency. Uh, I would see that in twenty to thirty years, but you will still have the CBDCs. 
um, because the CBDCs, but they, they also need to be, they need to have a regulator um, and that regulator would be Bitcoin. And AI. Well, AI will be the CBDC. The CBDC is no way going to be an algorithm. An AI central banker will beat the shit out of any policy for a country versus a human led central banker. That's inevitable. I, I, I couldn't disagree less. So uh, everybody who's in the audience right now, grab your tinfoil, grab your local uh, favorite NFL helmet, wrap it in tinfoil and uh, get ready for the ride. Uh, Chris, I agree, Simon, unfortunately. Chris, what's going on? Who's going to control the plug for the AI, though? And can somebody pull the plug out? That's my question. Well, it's when, when you hit singularity, it. it's... Oh, you mean the plug? Uh, but a singularity, is that going to involve the, the, the AI actually plugging itself into... Or maybe we won't need electricity by that point, right? Oh, that's why I gold, gold is still the hedge against Bitcoin. So gold regulates Bitcoin. You, you still need... If you want to unplug the whole grid, then you still need gold at that stage. Fair. How is nobody talking about the fact that we, we achieved nuclear fusion in the last like six months and nobody talks about it? Like we, we created energy out of nothing, but no, we don't talk Fair. about that. Well, let me bring it back uh, real fast, if you don't mind. Um, yeah, sorry. We went topic, really off the rails. Which was, uh, bring, it, bring it back. <laughs> uh, Fidgetal mentioned before, uh, why would a, a state, a, a nation state, support crypto and of course the answer is no nation state would ever support crypto because crypto uh, pulls power away from the nation state if it's if it's actually crypto barring cbdc which is a completely evil form of uh, mutant crypto which almost is a separate topic but you know the the idea that crypto would pull power and would be opposed you just call mutant crypto by the way <laughs> it is mut mut absolutely mutant crypto <laughs> As is go much ahead, of what's go. going proof, on. on proof of evil. <laughs> proof of evil. Whoa, 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 whoa. Whoa, you just brought the theory into that. Let, let's let's pull yeah. back. Oh, well, a lot of CBDCs are going to be built on Ethereum. Uh, proof and of uh, consensus is actually one of the one of the leading developers of uh, CBDC. But but aside from that, you know, nation states supporting crypto never happened, never going to happen. India being against uh, crypto, wanting to ban crypto, obviously was always going to happen from day one. Uh, U.S. will get there eventually when too much power is pulled from the government towards crypto. Bitcoin and Bitcoiners have known this for, for over a decade, so there's no surprise there. Here's the thing. None of these nation states are, are uh, proposing changes to the Bitcoin protocol, right? They're not like writing BIPs. They're not engaging in decentralized governance. They're not even talking about the Bitcoin protocol. And why is that? It's because they have no power over the Bitcoin protocol. The Bitcoin protocol is sufficiently decentralized to take power away from the most powerful actors on the planet Earth, which are these nation states, these governments. Nothing else, very little else that we're talking about as crypto has that power. Everything else that we're talking about was built within the rules of the game. And within what, about the rule what, what about ordinals, Chris? All, all oracles are subject to, to some no, sort I, of government. I, I, said, I said ordinals. It was a Bitcoin joke just for a moment. Oh, okay. Sorry. I thought you said oracles, but you're going to get me fired up on that too. Oh, but, I, I, can um, get I can get fired up for hours, course, but I won't. <laughs> my, my point is that everything that's been built that's not sufficiently decentralized was, in my opinion, rushed to market uh, because it is ultimately going to be captured by government. Everything. Every single thing that government can reach, it will reach, it will corrupt, it will bring into its into its uh, uh, bosom, you know, and it'll force it to make trade-offs that'll take it out of the crypto uh, uh, mindset and into the regulated financial system, which in my opinion is evil, you know, and is anti-crypto. So I think that uh, patience is what we need to have. We need to watch this for 10, 20, 30 years. Everything that's being regulated now is gonna become irrelevant. And the stuff that's gonna last is the stuff that the government can't touch like the Bitcoin protocol. And you'll know they can't touch it because they won't talk about it. They'll ignore it because it's too big and too powerful for them to wrap their arms around. Here's the problem, Chris. So I just watched The Whale last night um, and it reminded me essentially of Wally. I'm not sure I'm ready to wait until we turn into blobs rolling around to identify the fact that we failed ourselves until we allow uh, the, te 
Can I just say Wally terrified me as a child? Like that was a horrifying future. Um, as watch as the a whale. child to watch. watch I'm just dying at the reference. Watch, watch. The reference is killer. <laughs> <laughs> the whale and Wally. But I, I couldn't do better, guys. I, I can I tell apologize. you right now. I can tell you already right now. I can save you some time. We've completely failed ourselves. You can tell we failed ourselves by the, for instance, the number. And no offense to anybody here. I know you'll take offense, but none men. The the amount of people that are already involved in this process, in the regulatory process, in the legal process. Just in crypto, which was supposed to be an anti-bank, anti-regulation, anti-government thing, the amount of people that are making six, seven figures just on doing the paperwork, just on doing these these court cases and, and lobbying and, and all of this stuff, that's the sign that we've already failed ourselves with the stuff that we've built so far. We have to think longer term with this or else, you know, we're just going to keep getting disappointed. Again, that's the whale on the wall. Simon, what's going on? Yeah, so there's a, there's a really good reason to support less crypto or, I, I mean, I'd say Bitcoin, but, um, you know, some people might want to go for more crypto. Um, to me, crypto will just be security tokens in the future. Um, there's no doubt about that in my mind. Um, but the the... The main reason to support Bitcoin is the same reason why President Bekele did it. Um, countries have two choices. They either borrow money from the IMF and bow down to the economic hitmen um, and tight policies, or they borrow money from China's Belt and Road Initiative for infrastructure funding, 5G rollout, whatever it may be. Um, the reason to support Bitcoin is to give yourself a third choice. So this is why I was really excited about being a part of the, you know, the the Bitcoin bond project, we we created the first one in 2014, a Bitcoin mining back bond in Iceland, um, which was powered by volcanoes. And when Bekele made Bitcoin legal tender, um, the opportunity to show the world that you could raise finance with a Bitcoin back bond, um, and show that there is a third alternative, which is remaining sovereign. Um, you know, you, that. That is a very compelling thing. So once a sovereign state can raise finance through a Bitcoin backed bond rather than borrowing from the IMF and Bekele is aiming to set the standard, um, then you show that there is a path to sovereignty, which is a political. Um, and remember, the other reason to support it is because, unfortunately, the, the less optimistic one is world wars. Um, during a world war, countries don't trust each other and they settle in gold. But gold is very, very hard to settle. So at the end of a world war, the losing country has to settle the debts of the winning country. And no one trusts each other's currencies because what happened after the last world war. Um, so at that stage, Bitcoin would be a very compelling way of settling um, during and after conflicts. And uh, so th those are the two reasons why, uh, you know, you do it because you're in a you're in a power struggle in a in a hostile environment um or you're Simon, trying to get a competitive I'm, edge I, I, i'm gonna i'm gonna insist that you stop speaking logic this is not a space for logic this is a space for irrational governmental control um i think there are some balloons up i think i'm looking i'm in new york right now i see some balloons above um Bitcoin will not survive. Bitcoin's going to die. No, Mario does enough guys. balloon spaces. Let's keep it on crypto. I know. That's, that's what I was kidding. <laughs> but Bitcoin would be the balloon, by the way. It, it's just the government hasn't hit it yet. It's, uh, it's pretty evasive. Crypto, what's going on? Yeah, and, and also the, the concept of just, um, you know, retirement plans built upon hard money over you know a multi four year cycle so when you have bitcoin as legal tender and you have the opportunity to you know build build a wealth effect and bring back austrian economics so if a country wants to reject keynesian economics and they want to um demonstrate austrian economics built built upon hard money and people achieving a wealth effect i think we get to see whether that works in el salvador uh, so there's I, I think we'll see very compelling reasons why someone should support Bitcoin uh, and, uh, you know, build an economy based upon freedom. Because the, the, the choice you will have is you adopt China's central bank digital currency, which will be connected to a Belt and Road Initiative infrastructure funding loan, 
or you build a new financial market based upon security tokens and and Bitcoin back bonds. Uh, all of this so, is going to play so, out. So Simon, uh, because we're 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 having conversation for for thousands, and we want to talk about things that people probably don't understand. Will you be the first one on this space to talk about the uh, the new the new Silk Road, the new Chinese Silk Road? Uh, what am I missing? What's what's the new Silk Road? Oh, you mean? Yeah, you mean no. What the, what have I missed? Have I missed the, announcement? The, no, no. I, I just I don't think anybody really knows about the global debt structure that the Chinese have have created. Oh, right. To okay. go ahead. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, th this is what the the Belt and Road Initiative is. It's um, a way of look look at china's central bank digital currency right now if you if you haven't watched it um dcep dcep it's already had 15 billion dollars of transactions in beta it's already got 220 million wallet downloads it's about to launch its pilot project with um uh wechat you know 10 cents um which has already got 1.7 million um app downloads uh, they're lending out money at a significantly faster rate. Uh, the technological innovation, the rate of in, in investment in AI beats the shit out of Silicon Valley at the moment. Um, they're lending across, you know, their, their strategic partners. Um, and you will have to use their, you will have to use their CBDC before you can get an infrastructure loan from China. Um, and, you know, a, a lot of that, that that is being built if people are not paying attention to that china's got the far, the highest level of digital currency adoption of anywhere in the world you know you go there you don't pay cash you 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 bleep your phone when you in every in every transaction whereas in the us they see this as oh our digital payments are fine we don't need um a new one you know and and they had to do an executive order just to to push through their fed coin um you know because and the only reason China accelerated so fast is because they started in 2014. And then when Libra missed out the Chinese Yuan from their basket of currencies, when Facebook launched their currency, uh, they said, holy shit. Um, and, and the US shut down their opportunity for Facebook to rule the world. Let's go full circle. Why, why do we think Elon bought, bought Twitter? Um, yeah, I mean, he he gets it. Hopefully, there's going to be a Bitcoin pay, but I think there's Twitter coin coming, right? When what I've I've been out of the news because I've been messing around too much with all this Celsius shit. Um, what's been happening with Twitter coin? Has there been any news on that? No, just that uh, I'm I'm a full profound believer that he bought Twitter to create the WeChat of the West, and yes, it'll it'll literally just be the same thing. So crypto will be digital numbers, will be digital dollars, will be the same thing that you're talking about in terms of catching up. From a private perspective instead of a public perspective with the the same ideological perspective yeah which is more more dangerous i mean it depends what you want so you know if you if you want to really simplify the difference between china and america in in america capitalists and billionaires are allowed to rule the country whereas in china once you become a certain a certain level of size the government is more important than the business people Whereas in, in America, you know, the, 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 the Amazons are, are the ones that really control the shots. The government just doesn't let that happen in China. They just, you know, and, and that's really the big difference. So if, if Elon creates um, the WeChat pay of the West, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, a, that's, a, that's why they didn't let Facebook do it. And let's not talk about Amazon at the moment. That's a whole, whole nother conversation. Kuro, you, you've had your hand up, then Nico. What's going on, Kurt? Yeah, so I was going to mention the uh, kids out in Brazil that are buying uh, food at school with Bitcoin. I was wondering if people's perspective is that it is a dystopian future or the future. Because um, I'm really, like, I, I'm kind of uh, torn uh, just because it's kids buying food with Bitcoin, which is cool. But is it really where we want this to go? I think by definition, yes, in my opinion, uh, I think that uh, interestingly, Bitcoin, and this is one of the most interesting things that I've experienced in terms of uh, Simon, I think we'll, we'll be on the same page. I've been in crypto for 
12, I guess probably 13 years now. And people didn't understand the idea of fractionalization or the fact that you don't have to own an entire Bitcoin to interact within Bitcoin, um, which has been fascinating from a psychological perspective. But yeah, you should be able to spend Bitcoin in any fractional. Uh, what's the smallest value of, of a Bitcoin? A hundred million. Eight decimal places, so one qu one one quadrillion. Did you just say? You know, did you just say you've been in Bitcoin for thirteen years and you don't know the answer to that question? There's so I've, much bullshit I can call on this. It's insane. I've been heavy. I haven't been in Bitcoin. I've been in blockchain. Um, that you just made it even worse on your expertise in the space. I'm sorry. This is insane. No, get into it. Do you know where the word blockchain comes from? Uh, six sides of a block? No, it comes from a comment that Satoshi put into the code in order to explain how Bitcoin functions. Because every 10 minutes, Bitcoin transactions go into a block. That block gets connected uh, and built on top of the prior blocks. In order for Satoshi to explain this process, he used the word blockchain. Prior to that, he was using the word time chain. He was just coming up with a random word to try and explain how Bitcoin works. And because certain people didn't like that Bitcoin was being used for things like Silk Road, they randomly came up with a word called blockchain. And it was a buzzword uh, similar to DeFi that doesn't actually mean anything. And no, they just totally. ran with the word. My, my understanding was the word is block with six sides of an informational uh, a transaction that occurs immutably. So it's two, who, from, when, and then two more. Just like mining was not a random word. Mining was the idea that if you took a pickaxe to the moon and you mined a piece of the moon, you could never put that back. So it was, it was a permanent and mutable um, moment on the blockchain. I could be wrong, but that's what I was told. Simon, you want to jump in on this? Uh, sorry, Tane, I wasn't, I wasn't listening. What did I miss? <laughs> Never mind. Let's move on. So just, Simon, why does the word block exist? Say that again, sorry? Why is a block called a block? I was informed that it's six sides of a, of a transaction, information of a transaction. So to, who, from, when, and then two, two other, uh, basically, informational basis for it being a six-sided block. Uh, I'm completely lost. <laughs> I don't no, know. you're 100% correct, Fijidon. And it's in tandem as well. So it's in consensus. So it has to be run, like you said, immutable in consensus. So okay, the only the only thing that has ever been immutable in the history of the world has been Bitcoin transactions. And we don't even know if that's gonna stay that way forever. Like like there is nothing else. But isn't that what we're talking about? We're talking about that though, right? Is that what we're talking about right now? Tone, you just shit on my knowledge of, of blockchain by saying that the word block is completely uh, irrational and there's no logical application to the reason why it was termed block. Um, uh, I've been friends with and represented the founders uh, and probably people you know of Tether and, and the first stable coins, and in fact, the first smart contracts built on blockchain, uh, which was on the Bitcoin network. So I was informed that a block was because it's a six sided. Uh, transactional uh, moment that has six pieces of information to who from when and then two more that I, I can't remember off, offhand you're saying that it's completely abstract is that what you're saying Tom? yes Simon can you can you give me some input guys you need to have this conversation I'm lost I don't know where you guys are going I'll jump in when I've got something to say. No, 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 Simon, Simon, Simon. No, it all started with someone saying they've been in uh, in the crypto space for 13 years and he didn't know what the lowest unit of a Bitcoin was. I confuse it for Gwei with Ethereum for the, the 1979, 1980 Dr. Gwei fucking papers, dude. Uh, I, I, I'm not sitting here what, where, calculating where and sitting on, on Bitcoin on a regular basis. Yeah, no, where I think this is going is... When, when me and Tone used to hang out at, at Bitcoin conferences, um, blockchain was a really a, a mocked word because it, it used to be what everyone used to refer to as a database and everyone used to get really excited that they could make transactions cheaper, faster and better. Um, and then the banks tried to take the word Bitcoin 
out of uh, out of it and replace it with blockchain. And so I think what Tony is saying is if anyone's been through that evolution of Bitcoin versus the banks and then the word blockchain being something that was used in order to either raise finance or for a bank to try and take Bitcoin out of the equation and, uh, you know, essentially just do things that still nothing has materialized from it. Is it is that where you were going? Type. Yeah, pretty well much. Said, this, time, well this, said. Is Sorry. Why, this is also why I get frustrated with these spaces. Well, like, uh, this is why I don't usually show up here. The, the term blockchain started in 1991. Um, and it was originally because that was when they could first do time stamping. You guys remember, like, hash cash and that stuff. That's all part of the technology um, of, of blockchain. And um, and it actually takes uh, its, its terminology from a combination of um, ledger technology and... Um, and uh, data blocking. So you can look it up. It's all it's all there. I mean, you got to call things something. Like, I mean, we can argue about this, but, you know, I mean, the names come over time and they aren't always specifically descriptive. Sometimes they're whimsical. Sometimes they don't mean exactly what they're supposed to mean. But we deal with it and we move on. I mean, we say wag me in this space and we just had a key that came out of a monkey's butthole cell for 1,000 Ethereum. Um, and a little, it's a little bit of like breaking news in the middle of the space. Uh, the the key from Dookie uh, from Dookie Dash has actually sold for one point six million dollars, a thousand Ethereum. So that gamer really got his money's worth when it came to play to earn. If you've been enjoying the conversation, we always it's not monkey butthole <laughs> only comes out in business discussions around like crypto. It's so funny. What we end up saying is ridiculous. Yeah, we can be having, you know, the high level regulatory conversations and legal discussions. And at the same time, talking about monkey buttholes, it can all happen in the same conversation on the same stage. But congrats to Mongrel for that sale and to Adam Weissman or Weitzman for the purchase because it went to a singular person and not a DAO like the other offers had been from. Although the nine gag CEO must be feeling a little bit of pain having bid 999 ETH and getting outbid by one singular ETH when that was definitely in his wheelhouse to spare. Um, I want to throw over to Electric Bean because he had a, a question that he DM'd me specifically for Simon, something that Simon had talked about on YouTube. So I'll let him ask that real quick and then we'll keep it moving. Yeah, thanks, man. Uh, Simon, uh, I heard you on your YouTube. You're talking on a panel with Jeff Booth, Caitlin Long, uh, and a couple others. And you're just talking about socializing losses um, and, and bail-ins. Um, and obviously the bail-in that you're structuring for Celsius um, or are negotiating um, and Nova Wolf and the one that you did previously. I wholeheartedly agreed that socializing losses and bailouts are less ethical. Um, but just as far as Bitcoin adoption and why governments or big corporations would want to use Bitcoin ever, pay their employees in Bitcoin, um, it, it, I struggle to under or like understand the perspective of why a corporation wouldn't like socializing their losses. It's essentially a uh, a safety net to fall on if they become insolvent, they can just say, all right, well, the ta taxpayers will bail us out. Um, so I was just curious what your thoughts are on, I, I agree that it's ethical to, to do a bail-in and to have everyone be their own responsible party, but why would, why would mass adoption take place if you can just have taxpayers pay for it? The government keeps perpetuating that. Um, and and uh, yeah, I was just curious your thoughts on that. Okay, um, let me try and remember. I think that was quite an old interview, maybe. Um, but uh, I think I was talking about the difference between a free market solution for a distressed company like Celsius, where um, we just strip out all the assets and issue them to creditors and everyone gets equity in the NUCO, um, which is a process we're going through with Celsius right now, just essentially asset stripping it. Um, and making sure that those that were victims are the ones that receive the equity ownership. Um, versus a bailout, which is the process of the government printing money um, and then using crony capitalism 
In fact, the the hidden interestingly, this ties it all together with the AI conversation we were having together. The winners and losers of the financial crisis, and Tom will know this because he used to work for Bear Stearns, I think. Um, it was actually determined by BlackRock's Aladdin AI algorithm. Um, so the Federal Reserve used um, BlackRock, and they um, have developed the most sophisticated AI, which will power all central bank digital currencies in the future, most likely. Um, they were the ones that determined that that Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers should go down, and that um, Barclays, Numora, um, and the winners, uh, and JP Morgan. And in fact, they used that to determine that they should lend money to JP Morgan, and then JP Morgan would end up benefiting from them. Now, that's my my problem, is when you print money in order to issue a loan, and then you use an algorithm or crony capitalism to determine winners and losers, and then you kick the can down the road until we end up in a cost of living crisis like we're in today, um, and we will pay for it through inflation and uh, higher taxes in the end. Um, that's a pile of shit. Uh, that's, a, that's a Ponzi scheme. And so what, what I was suggesting is that you need to let companies fail. And so when, when a capitalist or a company comes along and says, so for example, there's the reason the Celsius is in this situation is because it was an illegal bank without a license and the SEC allowed it to get to $30 billion of assets under administration um, rather than shutting it down. And the reason they did that is because they wanted to gain um, the fines that they could get from allowing companies to become this big. And so it was a complete failure. Um, but uh, uh, once you hit the stage when you realize that Celsius is an effect, was using $600 million of client Bitcoin in order to pump up the price of the sell token, marking the sell token to market so that Alex Mijinsky could exit scam his sell token on his customers and ended up paying out $1.2 billion of yield more than they generated by defying people's money. Um, essentially, the uh, at that stage, you need the company to fail and then a bailout is not, you know, is not the government, a bailout is essentially the government coming in. But if an individual corporate company decides to asset strip it and issue equity to creditors, which is what we're going through in the restructuring, um, then that's just a simple capitalist process with no crony capitalism. The bit that I hate is it turned out that chapter 11 itself is a disgusting, corrupt process. And it's turned out that the lawyers representing the UCC also represented the bidders um, and they've been using the chapter 11 process in order to rinse 100 to 200 million from creditors in legal fees to essentially do what SBF did, spend client money, but legalizing the process and get the judge to sign off on it. Um, so sorry, I, I just covered a whole bunch of spaghetti junction of different things. Um, but I think that was what I was referring to that I believe you know, crony capitalism is the problem, and that that's the problem from receiving money from governments, which is a bailout. Uh, but capitalist solutions, I think, uh, the free market can determine how to deal with um, shitty companies like Celsius that scam their clients. Yeah, Simon, sounds like the restructuring of Celsius isn't going too great. I have not kept up with it. I had a feeling it was going to be a giant shit show. The the yeah the bit at the moment. Um, well, we're, I'm still fighting. It's consumed eight, eight months of my life, but it's the kind of project I like to do. I like I like to mess around with big financial problems, and this is a big financial problem. Um, but the U.S. court system, man, you you guys in the U.S. Oh man, lawyers lawyers are the winners of all this process. So that brings us back to the the, the lawyer panel. You um, actually you actually you actually, had, you actually had it coming. That's one of my most uh, passionate approaches to blockchain in general, which is getting rid of lawyers. And I think automation using blockchain, obviously data on the blockchain is not immutably true, but it's immutable as to whatever truth you can uh, gather or, or inject into it. And I believe that um, and some, some of the stuff that I'm working on heavily is using blockchain to get rid of lawyers as best we can. And I think there's a lot of value that we can bring in that regard. But uh, Nico, crypto, 
I think crypto had had their hand up. Oh no, it's okay. You can you can go ahead. Thank you though. I just had a question for Simon. Simon, um, are you dealing with Celsius right now? The restructuring and stuff. How 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 many treaties? Um, you don't have to answer like exactly is necessary to leverage against like a local currency, like. And what I mean by that would be like what SBF did, what, you know, over leverage and then do a cash out, um, basically ultimate failure, right? So how many treaties does it take to work with that many different government currencies? Do you know offhand? Uh, what's the connection? I don't, sorry, I don't understand the question. What, what do you mean by a treaty? Between, between an exchange like cryptocurrency in exchange and the local government authority and and their monetary system. Uh, yeah, there sorry, are, there, are no, there are no there, there are no treaties. Dude. It's no just treaties the US at government, all. No, it's the U.S. government trying to pull back cash before SBF can move the cash elsewhere, which I think is what Simon is doing with on a regular basis. If, if, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, by, by that, what I mean is um, in the Celsius case, um, it was ruled by court because um, Celsius is a very, and many of these cases were very unique because they were illegal banks that didn't have securities license to offer the EARN program. They didn't have their custody license to custody people's crypto assets. They rehypothecated without a banking license. Um, and uh, they they did they issued lots of loans without having um, lending licenses, and so in if a bank goes bust, you you have a very well defined process where another bank has to take over, and you auction off the assets. And the same with a broker, um, there's a a SEPA liquidation, but Celsius sits in this illegal bank, and so the court ruled that our money belongs to Celsius. Uh, which requires a banking license in order to achieve it. So the ruling was completely illegal anyway. So now you have this situation where Celsius owns our money because they had it by contract in the terms and conditions when they did a bait and switch um, because they were getting regulatory um, issues. And so you've got this, that, that unique situation where they can then spend our money on the restructuring and lawyers are just like gone on for eight months and we had to force them to create a real plan, but now we're getting towards the end of that process, hopefully. I think we'll be done by August or September, hopefully. But Simon, the issue is not as much, start. I hear you in, in a bunch of spaces that I'm on, we're on, in terms of saying that they're unlicensed, unlicensed, unlicensed. The issue is not that they're licensed or unlicensed in terms of potentially uh, having a backstop, right? The issue is that it was the over collateralization and, and issues with regard to transparency and use of funds, that's the, the core issue, correct? Oh yeah, but they, those are solved by regulation. So if you if you have a banking license, you can create client money and create a Ponzi scheme, but you get access to FDIC insurance and they socialize the loss to taxpayers. Um, eventually that whole house of cards tumbles. And if you have a situation like, uh, like um, the 2008 where FDIC only insures 1% of deposits, then taxpayers just that was, just my, pay that, for was it. My, that was my point though right like there isn't any full insurance scheme or, or structure, right yeah yeah so there's there's no insurance so the way you typically deal with that address that is you sell a security and that's why you have securities laws which is if you want to give me your bitcoin and invest in a hedge fund uh then you could lose all your money and it's only if appropriate to a certain class of investor um, and we have to give you full disclosures how we're using that money. And then you have enough information to assess whether you're willing to take the risks. But Celsius just didn't sell it as a security. Instead, they said, you're lending us your money. It's now ours. And we're going to spend it with no disclosure and no suitability. And then Alex Mijinsky went out and told the world that it's safer than a bank and you could generate 10% yield and they'd broken the code and, and persuaded everyone to transfer their life savings and retirement funds over. And you're fully regulated, correct? Uh, at Bank to the Future, we're a securities business. So every time, for example, when we offered a, a mining, we, we launched a mining backed security, uh, that was a security. So we told people what we're doing with the money. 
they invested, they received dividends, and it was structured as a share. And if the if it goes wrong, then you lose all your money. So yeah, we're we're a registered securities business, and then when we hold custody for virtual assets, it's done by a registered virtual asset service provider. So we can't mix client assets, client virtual assets, client shares, and our operational funds. The issue was that Celsius just literally mixed operational funds with client funds, said they're theirs, and then Alex Majinski used it to pump the price of sell tokens so he could exit scam on his community. But Sam, let's call a spade a spade. Um, what are your your year-over-year returns or, or your uh, KYP? Oh, well, we, we have lots of different securities. So we've raised finance for 100 different companies. And so if you invested in Coinbase, then, you know, for example, if you invested in Kraken, we raised at a 20 million valuation and then they're set to IPO for 20 billion or their last secondary before the IPO was 20 billion. Those are some of our good ones. But we've done 100 companies. Eight of them became unicorns, blockchain.com, Circle, Kraken, um, Coinbase. Uh, and then we had probably about five that were run by narcissistic sociopaths like Alex Mazinski that scam people and uh, burn the company to the ground. And then you have a bunch in the middle that uh, that are, are trying to figure out where they're going. Uh, I, I, I love how like it's so hard to figure out what Simon's position is about a particular person or entity. <laughs> like, I'm just like writing these and tweeting them out. Um, <laughs> But um, <laughs> no, crypto. What 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 I was trying to get at is, if, if you're making substantially aggressive returns in comparison to money markets, there's some. No, it's, it's 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 not a comparison. You you can't compare a money market product to a high risk venture capital, high risk high return. No, no, I'm I'm company. saying the companies the companies that you're saying that that shot the bed were companies that were trying to promise uh, unrealistic market money returns. But one of the things, if I could just very quickly just um, mention, one of the biggest problems is actually that so many retail investors don't understand what is and isn't possible in a financial instrument. Like, I mean, one of the things that happened with Celsius is that um, they, he basically, Alex basically gave most of the control of the money over to um, the guy from Kefi, who was, was just playing with monopoly money and taking crazy risks. And he said that Alex had, um, had, uh, you know, told him that he was hedging and, and Alex said, no, that guy was hedging. That guy is not even a licensed um, uh, man hedge fund manager. So uh, yeah, he, I, I he really, handed over $2 billion to it, Kefi. To some and guess what, guess what the contract was? The contract was take all of this ETH and Bitcoin or take all this ETH, put it in DeFi contracts. And then they had a profit share agreement where if the price of ETH went up, they received a cut. So literally, you could lose a bunch of ETH, but if the price of ETH went up, uh, then he had a greater profit share. That, that was the contract that he claims. Uh, and then he just stole a bunch of client money as well and, and through, a, through a conversation where they structured the deal over WhatsApp saying, trust me, bro. I mean, and this is the kind of thing that, um, you know, a lot of people who are retail investors, particularly who don't have a lot of financial education, this is the biggest problem. Like a lot of people who went into um, Anchor, remember on Terra Luna, where literally your money is supposed to sit there. You lock up your money and it's supposed to do a 20% return. Um, and I'm, you know, I try to tell people like, put money in a piggy bank. Does that come out with 20% more? Because I want that piggy bank. That's just not realistic. So part of this really is, um, you know, people are getting away with a lot of crap. But a lot of it is because there's a lot of people who are, are not as educated into determining what seems realistic and what isn't. The other big problem that we have is a lot of Web2 money went into blockchain and they wanted fast builds. And what we ended up with is a blockchain that on one side is transparent for like the users, salut. And on the other side, salut is a black box, essentially. So they couldn't, they didn't build it on blockchain they basically put a black box of operations on the other side of the of the chain doing something with the money. And it's not transparent at all because it's off chain. So we have no idea what they've been doing. So what we wanted was a bank where 
okay, you can see what we're doing with the money, but we see what you're doing with the money. But instead, what we ended up with are too many applications where they see what we're doing with the money, but we were never the problem. On their side, we don't know anything about what they're doing at all. And, and that there's so many builds that ended up that way. And a lot of it is because we have so many investors who are putting that SaaS model onto Web3 and it doesn't work. You know, there's that move fast and break things crap. And then, you know, and, uh, and essentially just build an MVP and we'll pivot. Pivoting in blockchain is, is pretty much impossible. Like you have to fork and you see how, much, how long and hard it is to fork. So for the people who don't, um, you know, for Web2 people, and I'm looking at you like some of the big investment banks are the ones who are coming in here and they financed a lot of these frauds. And I don't hear them coming out and saying, you know, I'm so sorry, you know, we, we did this and we put our name on it. We advertised that we were in, we were part of this. Now, what's interesting is that now the SEC seems to be going after those influential um, investors to say you are basically a promoter, which I think is going to be a big game changer. Um, it, it will be good in the sense that maybe they'll actually do due diligence now. But it's not good because that's going to chill more money into the um, into the the industry, right? But what we need are more educated investors. We need educated users and educated investors. It's really hard to do this when people are like, you know, I just need money. You know, I need to make some money at some point. Uh, I, you know, like my job, my four jobs don't pay enough for me to be able to pay my rent. So I need to make some money, and that is really the bulk of the people who are in blockchain post 2020. So understanding the dynamic of what's happening, I think, is really important to understanding how to change it. I think a lot of the, you know, like lawyers, the use of lawyers and things like that, um, that that can happen once we have two-sided blockchains that are transparent. We'll be able to see exactly what people are doing. But until then, well, the problem is how are we holding people accountable? And transparent blockchains are one of the things that people fight against a lot because, like I said from before, anonymity is something that is so coveted in this space. And it's one of the things that the space has been established upon is being able to remain anonymous with all of this. Um, I did bring, we started the day on uh, the emoji ruling or the emoji discussion at least. And I did bring Dogecoin ride up because I wanted to ask if uh, you've ever used the rocket ship emoji or the uh, stock chart go up emoji or the money bag emoji in any of your tweets. And if so, are you nervous at all after this judge has ruled the case can go forward on that? that they might be coming after other, you know, crypto Twitter people uh, at some point in the future? Uh, first question, yes, I've used them all, uh, depending on the situation. And no, I'm not nervous at all. I say bring it on. Can you comment on that? Like, look, the, the SEC or the government, they're only going to go after people that made a lot of money. Like, if you are some uh dog emoji on twitter and unless they know for a fact you've made like hundreds of thousands of dollars they're not gonna care like like you are irrelevant like this is why they went after the famous people like kardashian and uh well, let me give you a, dj Cotton. let me give you an example sir so I, i'm not a crypto person at all i'm come from uh sports podcasting i'm a headhunter so i'm the type of person that they people reach out to to make connections like Floki, in a couple minutes here, I have to take off. I got Rock, Rock Zacharias from Doge Chain, and we're doing a show with them. So, no, nope. I'm the outsider. I'm the person that is brought in, um, and it's kind of a cool thing. I don't proclaim to be a crypto expert at all. I stay in my lane, um, and I'm really good at putting these shows together. You can ask Fidgetal. He's been on my space. A lot of people up here have, um, but definitely, yeah. No, I, I'm with you. Um, I just stay in my lane. I do what I do best, and I don't profess to be what I'm not. Peter, yeah, go sorry. for it. Just two Doge, points. Doge to the ground. Hey, now, come on. <laughs> just a reminder that this particular case we're talking about, the NBA Top Shot one, is a private litigation. Um, it's coming from the Rosen Law Firm, who is known in the security space. So they are picking the deep pockets, but it is not the SEC going after it. 
And the second point, Doge, like, I don't know if you, I don't know what you do, but if you yourself are not the one creating and then selling the token, whether an NFT or not, in my view, you can put whatever emojis you want, because it's not, you know, you aren't the person that sold Thank it, you. so it doesn't matter what you put forward. No, there, there, there's promoter liability. Yeah, we did see the um, that that case that came down a couple months ago against the influencers, the crypto or the stock trading influencers, I should say, um, that were running pump and dump schemes in discords and stuff, and the SEC levying against eight different influencers during that time who were running those schemes. Uh, Malik, the, and the call I should withdraw and amend. Like also, if you're getting paid by the entity that created the token, then that's, you know, promoter life. Right. That, that's going to be the big one, right? Like, no one's going to go after you. If you believe in Dogecoin and you plaster Doge uh, stickers everywhere, no one's going to come after you. But if you got Unless paid, you had $200 million worth of Dogecoin in your wallet. Which I don't. Hey, I just want to use this opportunity to um, shout out to Tone Vase. I think one of the longest standing influencers and from what I can tell, maybe maybe I'm wrong. I don't know if you've burnt with, been burnt with anything, Tone. But I don't think you've promoted anything more than Bitcoin in the whole time you've been creating content. And how easy would it have been, Tone, to... How many times did you get approached by someone that would have paid you a shit ton of money to promote something? <laughs> oh, no, that was infinite times. You know, I've never promoted anything. I have been burned uh trying to do what you do right i've been burned many times uh trying to uh be a vc and investing in companies which is why i no longer do that but i've always stayed away from uh promoting something but that's also because as much shit as people give wall street like i saw from day one that ethereum was an unlicensed unregistered security i recognized it uh but uh, it looks like the sec will never do it i saw the same thing in ripple uh, the SEC did go after Ripple eventually for it. I mean, these are, uh, in my view, have always been on registered or licensed securities. Now we can debate whether uh, SEC should exist. We can debate how the SEC should enforce the law. Um, no, Tone, Tone, can we have conversations about whether a token that is launched arguably illegally, but then gains functionality and utility, then becomes potentially not illegal? Not really. I mean, it was launched. I got an interesting debate. Um, so, sell token is an unlicensed security, um, but all of the tokens in the app on Celsius, which is 97% of the supply, are about to disappear. Um, and yet, the, 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 the tokens that exist outside the app still exist, and some exchanges will still list it. Um, and then the company's going to disappear. What the fuck happens to a token like that? So I would just it, that, it, it becomes it becomes decentralized, sort of for a minute, right? Until someone collects all the token. So I, I guess what we'll solve here. By the way, Tone, uh, Simon, happy to have a, a, a spirited debate uh, in another space, which just be called. Uh, I think we call it uh, security or whack a mole. Right. So at the end of the day, kind of decentralization just becomes a whack-a-mole game um, in terms of there's nobody to whack. So therefore, is it illegal? Kind of at the core, right? So there's nobody in Bitcoin that you can actually hold accountable. Therefore, is it able to be held accountable? And therefore, can we have a slightly different conversation in terms of uh, a, a token? So, Tone, what you're saying is that no token that's issued off of a functional blockchain or anything can ever be utility within the, the guise of what is not a security and what can be legal within the U.S. Uh, legal framework. Is that what you're saying? Uh, well, you threw the utility word in there, which is a whole, whole other conversation. Now, um, I think that something like Litecoin and Monero is very difficult to make the argument that Litecoin and Monero were ever securities at any point. Uh, but on my law podcast that we've done, we actually made the argument that Ravencoin, which was also launched as a proof of work coin from the very first block, we made the argument that Ravencoin was a security, uh, even though it was launched identically to Litecoin. And the reason uh, why we made the argument that Ravencoin uh, was a security was because by the time Ravencoin has came out, 
uh, this concept was no longer novice and a project. And you can claim that convincing people to redirect their hash power is an investment of money. Uh, it was in the form of electricity, but it's still an investment of money into a common enterprise, which is uh, the Ravencoin team that was going around for a year, uh, you know, promoting it. Uh, and people were only redirecting their hash power uh, in order to get early Raven coins uh, so that the value of them would rise due to the effort of the Raven coin foundation, uh, then getting it listed on exchanges and all that other stuff. Like it was never so, going so, to be organic. So, so two things, one um, effort is energy, energy is money. We're all speaking the same conversation. Right? Consideration is effort, not money. We have to put effort to get money in the first place. Um, I, I like how you, you, did, you did a jump. What, what was your jump? You skipped. You said the efforts of others and you said the foundation. No foundations will ever survive SEC scrutiny or legal scrutiny at the end of the day. That, that's one of the biggest jokes, period. That a foundation somehow insulates you from, from legal scrutiny because you're an artificial uh, uh, 503C or, or, or some other nonsense. Like, why does the fact that why does so let's say I, I launch a security or I launch a token onto the world, but I don't take a penny that someone makes it legal because it's a charity? No, there's nothing to do with that. It's, uh, it's, a, it's irrelevant whether you made money or not, whether a security law was broken. Mm -hmm. It means that people were duped, right? So, another time, an, another show. Um, uh, Tom, I don't know where you live, but happy to have a chat about the, your gripes. Uh, before we close out, Peter, and then Crypto, and then we have to end in about a minute. I okay. Well, I'll be quick. Just in terms of utility, like I don't think that insulates anyone from liability either. Utility means almost nothing. It's inherently subjective. Like if I just say like, oh, this token entitles you to a T-shirt, who gives a fuck? The same thing as if Ripple says, oh, no, XR Peter, utility is, is defined by the idea that's been uh, that's been fraudulently misrepresented is, did you buy it for nothing but money? Meaning, well, would no, you no, buy no, it if it went to zero? Uh, can we get back to the utility, for example, of creating a problem and then saying I have a solution with this utility token for the problem is not real utility. Dude, like, what do you think? What do you think Craig Sellers would tell me every fucking day? I'd come up with great ideas and he'd be like, yeah, but you don't need the token to solve that problem. Yeah, exactly. I so agree. But, no like Binance, token, token, Binance token does not actually have utility. It's I agree. I agree. I agree. But I do think that the, so the, there's only two, there's only two camps of discussion here. Either a token can never have utility, which I disagree, or all tokens can have utility if done properly. And all I'm trying to say is if we sit here and say, I don't think that Bitcoin has utility. I, I very rarely see tokens that have true utility. And for me, the definition of utility, if we can break it down as simple as possible to the average listen, you hear the word utility. They say staking. That's not utility. That's, that's an incentivization to not sell by giving you magic internet money so hopefully you won't sell, decrease, de uh, decrease supply, increase demand, floor price go up. The, the word utility has been has been bastardized. If you break it, break it, break it, break it down. The idea of utility is. Does it matter what the price of this thing is or did I buy it for it? Go ahead, Tone and then Peter. Uh, of course, Bitcoin has utility. It has the ultimate utility. Bitcoin is the first unconfiscatable asset in human history that has utility. Uh, Bitcoin is uh, the only digital data you can send, uh, you know, over the internet or in the digital realm with so up to this point with finality where you lose possession of that data. That is ultimate, that, that is the utility. It's just that so happens that this utility's best use case is money and value. It just, you know, turned out that way, right? But of course, Bitcoin has utility. And your token can have utility. It doesn't have to have speculative price fluctuations, right? So for example, uh, Tether has utility. It doesn't, well, it's 
I mean, it has some. It price doesn't have. It doesn't have utility. What what Tether has is stability. Can I, no, can it has I, utility. I, I have to step out in a second. So can I just very quickly just to add? I'm not getting into the is this a utility or that a utility. I just want to say that decentralization does not protect you from liability. Utility does not protect you from liability. Um, being uh, some version of decentralized. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. No, no, it doesn't. Yes, no. it does. True what? utility does. Decentralization protects you. No, it really doesn't. They've True already... utility does. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't. According to the SEC, if you want to come up with another regulatory scheme that actually does, then great. But not according to the SEC. There are other. There are. Few, okay, I got it. I gave the head out. But there are a few other things um, that that people think uh, protect you. A DAO doesn't protect you uh, as well as you think it does. Um, you know, a lot of them actually are just pools of liability, and and you have to understand how to structure those well. There's just a lot of issues that uh, still exist in this space. And I just caution people to try and understand where liability lies before getting into something and saying, well, of course it's protected. A lot of people come to me after they've been issued a subpoena and said, you know, like, well, but I thought that this counted. Remember, just because uh, like a division head or something says it, it's, it's not law. You have to know where the law comes from. Law, where the law comes from is very, very important. And I think a lot of people are just pulling statements like that are made by ranking officials in various organizations and even in cabinets, um, but not realizing that that is not actually law. That's a that's a perspective opinion or or it is um, a position statement. Crypto, crypto. I'll end with uh, two fallacies or or, or uh, inconsistencies in my opinion argument. If you have true utility. Meaning, if, if if a product actually reaches the true version of utility, I do, I do believe, and this is not legal advice, that you are insulated to a degree from from legal scrutiny. I believe that DAOs, if done right, which I believe none are done right yet, is an arguable uh, position to have legal sovereignty. Uh, I don't think if you're uh, incorporated or otherwise in a Wyoming or state that that means you're a legal DAO, obviously that's irrelevant, right? But what we're talking about is the word of the law is different from the spirit of the law. So it's function over ideology. Uh, I'll end with Peter and then uh, I'll see you guys too. Thanks, Fajital. Um, and, and great points all around. Really appreciate being on this panel. I just disagree with your definition of true utility. Uh, I think because it is some way and to an extent dependent upon its use defined by others, you know, we don't know what it'll look like in 100 years, whether it's Bitcoin or a DAO token. I know in 100 years, a hammer is going to be useful. And that's why you can sell a hammer in a store. I know that the Mona Lisa is going to be appreciated for art, but I don't know what's going to happen with these various coins. And it does depend on some element of subjectivity and embracement by the market, whether it's Bitcoin or anything else. Um, Bitcoin is my favorite, of course, but I don't think Bitcoin has true utility either because it does depend upon our collective desire as a society to use it rather than it objectively being useful to push a nail into the ground. Fair enough. And to go full circle, Bitcoin ordinals to the moon. No, that's all we can have as Tone, Elon Tone, on we, spaces and saying Doge are we gonna, to the moon. Tone, are we going to have the block size debate all over again with ordinals? Is it coming? No, no, not at all. I mean, uh, ordinals, uh, well, if we do have the block size debate, it would be in the opposite direction, Simon. Like, uh, if ordinals become that much of a problem, there'll probably be a push to lower the block size, which I mean, I don't think anybody cares. Like people are making a big deal out of ordinals for no reason. Uh, I think A, they're gonna, people are gonna, you know, give up on this ridiculous idea. And B, uh, it can move off chain, uh, like uh, to the liquid side chain. And they, they don't matter. I mean, no one's gonna pay a lot of money to push that into the Bitcoin blockchain. Like I don't, I, I think people are making a huge deal over it. Uh, the mempool is already pretty cleared. Uh, I, I mean, it, I, I kind of like it. I kind of like it because it, you know, gives more, uh, I guess, a light to Bitcoin and it could help push the price of Bitcoin higher the way, you know, this kind of stuff pushed the price of Ethereum higher. So I think the ordinals are doing a little more good than harm uh, to the Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, but eventually people will realize that you can put this stuff on the liquid side chain and not blow up the Bitcoin mempool. It would be cheaper and serve the same purpose. Okay, you guys hear it first. Tone says that ordinals are legit. 
Bitcoin's going to 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 the moon, and um, let's all buy a bunch of Ethereum. This is not wait, financial wait. advice. Am I selling my Ethereum. ordinals or am I buying more? I didn't clarify, please. I can't, guys. Let's uh, goody. Put some music, uh, preferably. Uh, what do, what do I want to hear? Right no, now? it's digital. We're going royalty free today. We appreciate everyone for coming out and joining right. in the conversation. It was an absolutely fiery conversation. We had a little diversion with our panel of lawyers, and we had some nice argumentative talks. Please share the space so other people can listen back and enjoy the conversation asked, that was had I asked today. For Rufus to soul on the way out, please. No, no, no. I'm just gonna play my own thing. But don't interrupt the outro. Like, why, why would you interrupt right in the middle of the flow, Fidgetal? Anyway, anyway, we appreciate you all for coming. We'll be back again Wednesday, same time, same place, right here on Twitter Spaces. Fidgetal will have a better taste in music than Rufus on Wednesday, and we will have a, another great show with a panel of people ready for you. Fidgetal, here's your outro.